Thank you, Suzanne. Well, welcome to our Investor Day for 2021. I'll be joined today by Doug Baird, a managing director in our group who leads technology investing for us, and Jasper Dale, our chief financial officer. Today, uh, we wanted to give you a report card on how we think we've been doing for the last five years and what we've done with the business over the last five years um, since we launched Brookfield Business Partners. Can we go back one, please? So as a reminder, our overall objective at BBU is to generate increased value per unit uh, over a long period of time. We do that primarily through capital appreciation of the operations we own. That was, that was our objective when we launched BBU. It remains our objective today. So how do we do that? Well, we buy high quality businesses. We take a hands-on approach to managing those businesses and drive operational improvement, drive cash flow, drive value creation. And we monetize those businesses at the appropriate time. Now to do all of this, we need organizational capability. So as our business has grown, we've been scaling up our operations to make all of this happen. You can see over the last five years, we bought 18 businesses and invested $6 billion at BBU share to do this. Now the total purchase price of these businesses was closer to $20 billion. And I'm, I'm talking about the equity funded to buy these companies which means that BBU gets to buy control of very large scale, very high quality businesses by partnering with institutional investors. And this is an enormous advantage that BBU has. We also made a number of bolt-on acquisitions within our operations to strengthen them over the last five years. Similarly, we sold nine companies for $3 billion at our share we generated 30% returns on these sales for our unit holders. Now, when we start selling the larger businesses that we've been buying over the last five years, the scale of our monetizations is going to increase dramatically. All of this activity means our business has grown a lot. Our company EBITDA is now $1.6 billion far above the $240 million it was when we created BBU. But size and scale alone don't really matter. As I said, we want to create value <clears throat> and performance on a per unit basis. So let's look at our FFO per unit. It's tripled over that same period of time. And our FFO per unit, including gains, has more than quadrupled. Now we'd encourage you to look at FFO per unit, including gains because buying and selling interests in businesses is part of what we do at BBU. So what does this all mean for value creation? Well, our net asset value is now $56 a unit. That represents an 18% annual compound increase in value. <clears throat> Jaspreet is gonna take you through this in more detail uh, when she speaks to you. And our market cap is more than tripled from $2 billion from capital appreciation and a couple of equity issuances along the way. As I said earlier, we can't scale the size of our business without building organizational capability. Today, we have 150 uh, investment and business operations professionals within BBU, compared to just 50 five years ago. This is a global team. It's on the ground in every region we operate in. Our business operations team works really closely uh, with the management of our companies to drive performance improvement, and there are a few members of them here today. We've now created something that we call the Brookfield Playbook. This is a very detailed outline of our investment and business operations uh, processes so we can maintain consistency as we grow. And it's something that all our people use throughout the, throughout the organization uh, it's an online tool. It's sort of a living, breathing thing that keeps getting better. And it's a tremendous training tool for our young people. Finally, we built really strong data analytics and digital capabilities to accelerate our progress. 
So apart from growing our business, we have a stronger profile than we did five years ago. We started this business with a number of smaller scale operations, a fair bit of commodity exposure and earnings volatility. Today we own global market leading companies with super high quality operations selling essential products and services. And what that means is even during an economic downturn, like the one we just lived through, our operations remain resilient and our cash flows are stable. Quite simply, Brookfield Business Partners is a very high quality business today. Our largest businesses include the global leader in advanced automotive batteries, the global leader in nuclear technology services, leading services pro providers in residential mortgage insurance in Canada, healthcare services in Australia, and water and wastewater services in Brazil. We're diversified by type of operation and region with, which further mitigates our business risk. And these operations are much larger than the operations we owned five years ago. The average asset size, the number of employees, the EBITDA, it's all grown. To put this in perspective, our average EBITDA for our five largest businesses is up from $75 million five years ago to $800 million today. So again, a reflection of the growing scale of our underlying operations. We are really pleased with our progress and hopefully you'll give us a pretty good grade for the last five years. But more importantly, where are we gonna go from here? Well, we're gonna keep buying larger scale, high quality businesses. Today, we see new investment opportunities in all our key regions. We're seeing buyouts, corporate carve-outs, partnerships, uh, underperforming situations globally. And because our team has grown so much, our deal flow is actually accelerating. We see far more opportunities today than we did five years ago. And this is a common question we get from our investors. You know, it's a competitive market. Are you still seeing stuff? And yes, I can tell you, I have never seen um, so much scale and quality of deal flow uh, as in the last year. So what this means for BBU is we have a much wider range of opportunities to choose from. Uh, we look at a lot of great deals at any point in time, and this means we're gonna keep growing, but the quality of what we buy is gonna keep getting better. Modulaire is a great example of the type of business we want to own. We recently announced the acquisition of Modulaire for $5 billion. It's a leading provider of modular unit leasing services in Europe and Australia. The business serves stable industrial, infrastructure, and public sector end markets. It's got a very large and established branch network. As a longtime supplier to our construction operation, we're quite familiar with Modulaire and the value proposition it provides. And the business is benefiting from more demand from, for temporary space solutions and a lower cost and more sustainable alternative to permanent construction. This company has grown historically through M&A and we're gonna put a lot of in attention into integrating all those acquisitions, increase its overall corporate efficiency. We're also gonna help Modulaire grow by leveraging the relationships we have in infrastructure, commercial real estate, and construction and we're gonna increase the penetration of value-added products and services it provides to its customers across its fleet of 240,000 modular units. We also announced the acquisition of another high-quality business recently called Dexco. Dexco is the leading provider of engineered components for towable equipment in North America and Europe. This is a market leader, it has a really strong competitive position, has a flexible cost structure, and it's the only business in its industry which has integrated manufacturing and distribution, which, which gives it a huge competitive advantage. We intend to continue growing this business, expanding into adjacent products, and supporting management in its M&A strategy, which has been very successful. And like Modulaire, 
we're going to work to improve operating efficiencies by reducing costs, implementing procurement strategies across its footprint. These are two really good, high-quality businesses. Both of them are market leaders. Both of them generate high returns on capital. Now, in order to accelerate our growth, we're expanding our reach. We've been expanding our reach into new sectors. Today, we're really active in business services, infrastructure services, and industrials. We've made investments in technology and healthcare, but these are areas we're putting a far greater emphasis on. These markets are enormous. They, they represent a large proportion of global M&A activity, and we like them because we can find providers of essential products and services with very attractive growth fundamentals. So very similar to what we're doing elsewhere. And we'll use the same approach as we do across the same rest of our business. We're gonna look for high quality businesses that we can buy for value, apply our mod operating model to enhance cash flows and value. We're building dedicated resources within BBU to support the growth of our business in these areas. And Doug Baird is gonna to talk to you shortly about what we're doing in technology. We're also gonna keep improving the businesses we own today. We've targeted $400 million in annual operating improvements at our advanced automotive battery business. We've already achieved $175 million of that. We targeted $350 million of annual improvement at our nuclear technology service business, and we've achieved a majority of that. And in our residential mortgage insurance business, we've already improved the return on equity from 12% when we bought it to 17%, and we think we can do better. So our business operations capability is gonna remain a very key part of what we do at BBU. So where does this get us to? Well, in the next five years, we should have a much larger business higher quality operations, and meaningfully improved value per unit. To put this in context, we think we can probably grow at 15% a year uh, in our NAV. We should end up with a unit price well over $100 per unit, and our overall NAV should exceed $16 billion. Now, it's possible we do something more strategic with BBU, which would accelerate this growth, uh, and looking at all the investment bankers in the room to help us out with this. Uh, but, but at a minimum, we feel confident this is what we should be able to achieve. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Doug. Uh, Doug joined us recently. He has a great background in technology. He's been a terrific addition to our team, and I think you're going to find what he has to say really exciting. Thank you. Thanks, Cyrus. Again, my name is Doug Baird. I've been at Brookfield for the last six months, helping to build out our technology investment sector. I think it's important to note I've been a, a value investor in software and, and tech services and technology generally for the last 20 years. But, but value doesn't mean cheap necessarily. Value means what's the value that we're gonna bring to a certain situation at this time of its evolution? In short, why am I the right owner at this stage right now? And, and that's what's so exciting to me about joining Brookfield was I saw the power of the ecosystem and the institutional knowledge that Brookfield possesses and the opportunity for a team to synthesize that and apply it to technology. And I'll go through what we're doing uh, through this presentation. So as Cyrus mentioned, we're broadening our investment sector focus. We're looking at healthcare and technology but it doesn't mean it changes the types of businesses that we're looking at, the same high quality businesses that we've been investing in, in business services, infrastructure, industrials, will continue to look in both in healthcare and technology. I'm fortunate to have a dedicated team here where we're, we, we believe that the, the dedication and the focus allows us to pick our spots, both in terms of reacting as deals come in, having a thesis, but I think even more importantly, being proactive in our approach, targeting the, the right sellers, getting our message out there, making sure that people understand 
what, what it is that we bring to the table and why we're differentiated and what is a crowded space in technology investing. We can leverage the rest of BBU in terms of as additional deals come in and complexity or scale. Uh, so we have an unlimited size in terms of how large we can get. And then we, we have the, the, the entire Brookfield ecosystem that we can rely on that allows us to have that differentiation and knowledge base. And, and obviously the operations team, we have dedicated operations for technology and then the broader team, because a lot of the situations that we come upon spans in layers, how, how to be more efficient that's the same for a company that, that develops blast furnaces or develops a software program. And, and so what makes us unique? What, why are we a preferred partner in this technology ecosystem? Well, I, I believe it's threefold. First, we're able to deploy significant amounts of capital at scale and we're patient. We allow the management teams to develop and build the, 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 the investment thesis that we all underwrote together. We have operational expertise that allows us to come in and supplement a, a good management team. And there may be things, M&A or, or other events that a management team comes upon once every five years. Our ops team does it monthly. Let's come in, let's help them do it faster and cheaper than they would on a standalone basis. And then the strength of the Brookfield platform, the, the 600 plus billion dollars of assets we have, well, what that represents, it's over 300 portfolio companies in 30 plus countries with 150,000 FTEs. That's an asset that is incredibly difficult to replicate and an asset that allows us to differentiate ourselves in the market as we're talking to sellers and management teams and, and displaying how we can bring more than just capital to an equation. And, and so as you think about where we're gonna focus within technology, it, we're gonna focus on areas that we think leverage our strategic advantage. These, these areas are the same areas where Brookfield's been investing for decades. Real estate and construction, transportation and logistics, energy power and utilities, industrials, services, right? All areas where we have, if not tens, hundreds of billions of dollars invested, management teams that we can rely on. We are the customer to, in a lot of sense, to software companies and technology service companies we're looking at. We know the pain points. We know how to help management teams drive into different markets and we have M&A, we have boots on the ground across the world that can be helpful. So we think about a $5 trillion market, as Cyrus mentioned, within technology. We're focused in software and technology services. These are the two most mature markets within technology, and so we have the opportunity to continue to deploy capital at scale within software and tech services. When you think within software itself, we're focused in both application software and infrastructure software. Application software is a specific software used for a specific use case, typically by one vertical within an enterprise. So think of accounting software. The finance team is gonna use this accounting software in order to develop 10Ks, tax, what have you. Uh, similarly, a CRM. A sales team's gonna use a CRM in order to manage their pipeline contacts and drive deals to close. It's mission critical, it's part of their daily process. Infrastructure software is slightly different, which actually sits horizontally. So think of uh, plumbing within your house. It's gonna be connected to every different point within, within an organization. Takes that data, brings it to one place, and then ultimately allows you to analyze that data in order to make more critical decisions with better information. Again, we're looking for high quality businesses within each of these sectors. Within IT services, we're really playing on a macro theme of outsourced IT spend. And, and so we're playing this twofold, both in digital services and traditional IT services. Digital services is simply just digitization of what have been manual processes in the past, allow people to do things faster and cheaper than they had uh, historically. And then traditional IT services, really, as we see enterprises continue to increase in scale, as technology continues to become more complex, we're finding that uh, what, what has been an in-house operation, CIOs are realizing, I, I don't know how to do this anymore. I, I clearly can't do it effectively. Let's outsource this to the experts who can do it actually cheaper than I can because I just can't even get the people anymore that know how to do these things. Uh, within both sectors, again, it's, for us, it's, it's high quality bu uh, businesses, no different than the other sectors within BBU. Uh, 
for me, the, the first thing, that, the first question we always ask is, is this a mission critical product? And, and we define that as, is this a product that's sold to an enterprise and used in the daily workflow of that end user? Quite simply, do I have to use this software? Do I have to have these services in order to actually you know, do my job? And, and we see this uh, in terms of high recurring revenue. Quantitatively, you can see it in the high recurring revenue of, of your historical results. We also look for companies in, in growing markets where they're market leaders. They may not be the largest in their market, but they're taking share from those larger legacy corporations. They're winning new logos from people who are larger than them and they may have more resources. And they're doing that because they have the product leadership. They have a product that people want. There's a, there's a pull, it's not just a push sale. And then we see, you know, in terms of new logo growth, they continue to drive additional, uh, additional sales with new customers. And, and so the, the, the benefit of software, the benefit of tech services and our technology is all these things are qualitative, yet they're quantitative in the results. We can look at historical results and extrapolate that into the future with a high degree of certainty in order to understand the free cash flow that this company will generate on a go forward basis. As we think about opportunities, it really is a consistent approach to value creation. Again, no different than the other sectors within BBU. We work with our operations team to, to find those levers that we can pull as the owner of this company. Why are we the right owners at this stage? How can we be a catalyst for change? Uh, buy and builds uh, consolidation. Think of we may buy a point solution within software and then buy additional point solutions in order to create a suite that allows us to cross-sell these point solutions to our customer base, but also have a stickier solution that we can sell uh, and see that revenue retention continue to increase. Go to market, we may, there may be a broken channel that we can help, uh, we can help uh, identify and, that, and, and help the management team fix. Product portfolio optimization could be that we need to go buy a couple of products, or it could be we actually need to put some products into maintenance mode and focus on the products that are actually driving the majority of our free cash flow. Uh, cost structure optimization could be, uh, think of disparate R&D centers around the world. Let's consolidate that into a center of excellence both onshore and offshore. And then management enhancement. We invest behind great management teams, but, but as our companies scale, as we create change, a lot of times we do see that we need to supplement those management teams with additional C-suite where, where, where applicable. When we find these great companies, when we have value alignment with, the, with those management teams, we're gonna be flexible in where we invest in those companies. It's important to us to really put on a risk adjusted basis, we wanna put capital in those great businesses with great teams. So it, we could be looking at traditional control leverage buyouts, non-control, preferred shares, you know, even debt. For us, it's about putting the capital in a, in order to see those risk adjusted returns. I've been really pleased with the, the progress to date. Uh, the last six months, we've looked at over 30 deals. Uh, th that equates to over $10 billion of potential equity investment. Uh, you know, and and it, it really runs the gamut in terms of opportunities. We've, we, we have one business we looked at, it's uh, $500 million plus of EBITDA, infrastructure software, mission critical, sits within uh, these organizations 15 plus year history. Uh, and again, it's, it's like plumbing in your house. You may have brass plumbing and PVC comes out, but you're not gonna change the plumbing. It's, it's too complex, it's too difficult, it touches too many places. Uh, and then uh, another business that we looked at is, a, is an ERP business for packaging and plastics. Uh, we were really attracted to this asset because of the fact it's a carve out from a much larger organization that doesn't know software at all. We can come in, we can work with that management team, give them the tools to actually understand their business better and help them manage it, and then also give them the equity incentive as real owners of their business and, and, and help them create some significant value on the upside. A good example of putting our technology practice, or technology thesis into practice is EverRise. So we, we bought this business, a technology services business that provides critical services to technology and healthcare uh, providers. But what's that really mean? 
So EverRise, quite simply, is, is an extension of the workflow of, of healthcare providers around, around the world. What, what we do, if uh, you call in, uh, you may be a client, and you, you're calling in order to figure out, do I need to schedule a surgery? What, what do I do? And, and, and you call, you talk to, you're calling the healthcare provider, it actually routes to EverRise, and we help you by going through a pre-agreed systematic approach Maybe you don't need a surgery. Maybe it's a, another consultation with uh, your doctor. Uh, and, and in this way, we can actually increase the quality of care to the patients and also help our customers uh, make sure they're doing it in a cost-effective manner. We were, we were attracted to the business because of the high recurring cash flows that we saw. 95% plus for a technology services business is, is really a great mark. And, and I believe you have this platform and for us, it was about how do we continue to enact change? How can we work with the management team to bring additional value? We're able to convince the seller to work with us on a proprietary basis in order to find a solution, find a, a transaction, and work with the team. And so as we, as we look at the base platform, we look at what we've been able to accomplish so far, we found growth both organically and, and through inorganic opportunity. We've been working with them in terms of how do we Increase, improve our retention metrics with our customers by selling additional products, cross-selling. How do we bring in additional high-profile clients? And we believe that our investment in EverRise has helped attract a, a, the next tier of clients. How do we work with share games and, and, and win in the marketplace? And then there was, a, there was a large pipeline of add-ons that the management team had sourced, but given capital constraints with the previous owner, they hadn't executed upon, and now they have the deep pockets and dedicated approach of Brookfield, and so they have the confidence to go look to how do I enact on my M&A pipeline. We've been working on margin improvements. We've been working with them on, on increasing not just their gross margins, but thinking through digitization. How do we drive a TAM expansion? How do we think about how we could actually drive revenue by offering additional services to the client base? And so it's still, it's still early days, but we've been really pleased with the progress we've made to date with, with EverRise and, and look forward to continuing to tell you about it. As I think about the technology sector outlook uh, and, and you know, think back on the last six months, but more importantly, think about the future and where we're going, uh, I'm really excited. Uh, we, we've got a dedicated team, we're focused, and, and we're, quite honestly, we're leveraging our competitive advantage. The, there are just so few competitors that can bring what we can bring to the table. The, the addition will bring all this value beyond just capital. Everybody's money's green. Uh, but we can bring that, that uh, differentiated knowledge base. And, and that's turning, that's resonating with sellers. And so we're seeing our pipeline increase, but even beyond just the total number of deals, total number of, uh, of equity dollars we can put to work, we're seeing the pipeline and sellers understand what our message is and bring us the types of deals that, that we're excited about. So, as I think about the opportunities coming up, we're gonna to continue to take swings in our at-bats, and, and I'm excited to come back uh, in the future and tell you guys about some of the home runs that we've hit. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jesper. Good morning, everyone. I'm gonna take about 10 to 15 minutes of your time and really talk about three topics. The first is providing an update on our financial performance, followed by a discussion on Brookfield Business Corporation, or the new paired entity that we're in the process of launching, and then finally provide an update on our view of value. Cyrus touched on how much our business has grown over the last few years. And this has been a very deliberate attempt to invest in essential service providers. We've been very focused on ensuring that we're putting our capital into businesses that are gonna be resilient through all market cycles. And this served us really well last year. We saw a very strong recovery in our business uh, year over year with substantial growth in both company FFO and company EBITDA. They both increased approximately 20% year over year. And it's not just overall financial performance that increased, but contributions per unit were higher as well. 
company FFO per unit, including and excluding gains, has increased substantially as we continue to build value in our business. And our financial performance is underpinned by a very strong balance sheet. We've been focused on ensuring that we maintain the financial strength of our business. And we've done that by refinancing our non-recourse debt where appropriate, as well as locking in interest rates in this historically low interest rate environment. Today, approximately 75% of our non-recourse debt it has fixed interest rates of approximately 4.8% uh, with an average term of approximately five years. In addition, our corporate debt, which is borrowings on our working capital facility, is at about 400 million and at a very reasonable cost of 3%. From a liquidity position, we're in a very, very strong position. We've got $1.5 billion of liquidity, and this is pro forma for the three transactions that we announced this quarter. And this doesn't include the $5.5 billion of liquidity that exists within our operations. We've talked to you about this in the past, but I wanted to revisit it. In addition to the really strong liquidity position today, we've also got significant levers to continue to enhance our liquidity. The first is distributions from our ongoing operations. As we've invested in large-scale, resilient businesses, the profile of our cash flows has improved quite significantly. Second is financing within our operations. Every day, we continue to work with all of our operations to enhance the underlying EBITDA of those businesses. And this leads to natural delevering in all of our operations. We've got an opportunity where it's appropriate to upfinance some of these businesses. And we can do that and either find growth in the operations or they can be distributions up to us. We've also got the ability at the corporate level to upsize the working capital lines that we have, which we use as bridge facilities between acquisition and monetization activities. Third is proceeds from asset sales. We will be monetizing assets, but we'll only do it when it maximizes value for the business. And it's not based on a perceived need for cash. And finally, the capital markets. Again, we'll access capital markets where it's appropriate and accretive to our overall business. So I wanted to spend a couple of minutes just talking about distributions and monetizations. As Cyrus highlighted, the profile of our business is quite different today than it was five years ago when we launched BBU. Today, our business is composed of large scale resilient uh, cash flow operations. And this has a direct impact on how much free cash flow these businesses can generate and provide up to BBU, or they could use these proceeds to delever or find growth within the business. Five years ago, we were generating 130 million of annualized free cash flow. And this is at BBU's proportionate share. At the end of last year, this number had grown to 550 million. And where we stand today on a run rate basis, our operations have the ability to generate $700 million of free cash flow. This is five times larger than it was when we launched BBU five years ago. And just to be clear, our definition of free cash flow is essentially company EBITDA, less cash taxes, interest, and maintenance capex. So we've got substantial cash flow that we're gonna generate within our businesses, and these cash flows can be used to fund a lot of growth within BBU. But we also expect that we're gonna generate additional proceeds through monetizations. So if we look back, 
over the last five years, and Cyrus touched on this before, but we've sold about half the businesses that we owned when we launched PVU. And we've sold these businesses, generating $3 billion of proceeds to fund our growth. More importantly, we've generated very strong returns on these monetizations. The, with an average IRR of approximately 30% and a four times multiple of capital on our invested capital. And this is really important. We're always focused on ensuring that we're maintaining discipline so that we're maximizing the returns that we're generating on our assets when we monetize them. And we want to be disciplined around monetizing assets just as disciplined as we are when we're making acquisitions. And when we make decisions around monetizing our operations, we ensure that we're maximizing returns for our unit holders. We may try to be opportunistic from time to time, but we'll only pull the trigger if it's maximizing the overall value of our business. So, as we stand today, we've got a number of large-scale businesses that are leaders in their markets and generate significant EBITDA and cash flow. At the right time, we will look to monetize these assets, and that monetization activity is going to generate several billion dollars of cash for BBU. In addition, we have a number of other businesses that are smaller in size, but where we continue to do work every day, which as we get closer to monetization will also generate additional liquidity for us. So overall, our financial performance has been really strong and resilient, and we've got significant liquidity to continue to fund the growth of our operations. While we've been very focused on ensuring that we're building value within BBU, we've also been looking at opportunities to expand our investor base. As most of you are probably aware, we announced the launch of Brookfield Business Corporation, or BBUC, earlier this year. BBUC is basically going to provide our limited partners or other investors with an opportunity to invest in a corporate structure to gain exposure to our business. And this is really focused on expanding our investor base to new investors who don't have the ability or don't have the inclination to invest in a limited partnership. We'll effectuate the creation of BBU through a tax efficient transfer of some of our operations into a corporate entity. We'll then do a special distribution whereby unit holders for every two units of BBU LP that you hold will receive one BBU C share. We'll continue to provide a 25 cent distribution on our LP units. And in addition, we'll be providing a 25 cent distribution on each BBUC share. We expect at launch, BBUC will be approximately $2 billion. Similar to our Brookfield infrastructure and renewable companies, BBUC will be structured to be economically equivalent and exchangeable into BBU LP units. The launch of BBU does not impact the financial disclosure that we provide our investors on a consolidated basis, nor does it impact how we manage the underlying business. We also expect that with the launch of BBU, will have a broader appeal to a larger investor base, given the preferred tax treatment, as well as the broader in, uh, index inclusion. We're working through the regulatory process now and hope to launch BBU and do the special distribution before the end of the year. And with that, I'm gonna spend a few minutes on our view of value for BBU today. Similar to prior years, this represents our view on spot value or spot nav and more of a liquidation value as opposed to a long-term franchise value. 
So in our view today, the total value at BVU is between eight and $8.6 billion, which translates to $54 to $58 per unit. We've provided a buildup by segment. Some of the key drivers uh, year over year in our NAV include, one, graph tech, which has a lower contribution this year. We, we value graph tech at the market price, but with the monetizations that we've been doing this year, the overall, overall contribution to NAV has been lower. This is more than offset by additional value through some of our other operations. The two larger ones include our advanced battery manufacturing business, Clarios, where we continue to execute on our operational improvements, as well as our residential mortgage insurance business, where, as Cyrus highlighted, we've already been successful in increasing the overall return on equity. As we look forward, we remain very confident in the upside potential within our business. As we continue to execute on the operational improvements within all of our businesses, we think there's an embedded growth of up to $75 per unit within our operations today. Cyrus discussed the potential of doubling the size of BBU over the next five years. And this is very readily achievable given that we're more than halfway there with our current portfolio. Just to be clear, the $75 upside per unit does not include any expansion in multiples. The primary drivers are continued execution of our operational improvement and enhancement of EBITDA at Westinghouse and Clarios. It also doesn't include any of the exciting technology investments or other new acquisitions we may make over the next few years or monetizations and recycling activity. So where we stand today, we've been very actively buying back BBU units because today our units are trading at the largest discount to our spot nav that we've seen. And I'm not advising anybody to do this, but if you're looking to sell any blocks, please make sure you call me. And thank you for your time, and I'll hand it over to Cyrus uh, to go through Q&A. Thank you, Okay, so I have a number of uh, questions that have come in here, and maybe I'll take one or two of these and then open it up to the floor. Uh, the first is, you've always targeted a 15 to 20 percent return on your investments. Are those returns achievable in the current environment with rates so low and the amount of capital that's chasing deals? Yeah, well, I, as we showed you and pointed out to you today, we do think we can keep doing that um, our, for all the reasons we talked about. Deal flow is accelerating. The quality of what we're buying is better. The quality of what we're seeing is better. Our team is bigger and better. And uh, as long as we can maintain our, the processes that we have in place, this, this is achievable. And of course, with interest rates coming down so, so much, um, you know, we've been refinancing all of our companies at lower rates. And the incremental cash flow over a five-year period is enormous. So the, the answer is yes, we feel quite confident in that. Um, next question, this is from Jeff Kwan. Are you using existing portfolio companies to identify potential technology targets? Doug, maybe uh, you can come up here and talk, talk about that. Are you using existing portfolio companies to identify potential technology targets? And, and the answer is we are. So we're doing it in a few, a few different ways. We actually canvassed all the CIOs for our portfolio companies, and we have a quarterly uh, meeting with them where we walk through what, what products do they use, what products are they thinking of implementing into their, their, their technology stack. It gives us a, a sense of not only where, where could we have differentiated knowledge on potential companies, but also where are our CIOs taking their businesses just to have a finger on the pulse of what's going on. And then I think beyond even our portfolio companies, we do leverage the rest of Brookfield. 
So a, a good example, we were looking at a, a property management software company, and they, they provide those services to people who own multifamily housing. Well, we happen to own a little bit of multifamily housing within Brookfield, and so it was a great way for us to talk to the people who run those departments and ask them where their pain points are with software and, and what they would, you know, do they like this software, their competitors, and it, it just gave us some, some valuable insight that was, uh, you know, for us, made it a, a much easier decision, ultimately not to move forward. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. I'll take one more here. Um, please update us on talent, talent retention and your ability to grow the team in a tight labor market. Well, well, as as I said today, we've grown a lot. Uh, you know, 50 to 150 uh, professionals globally, and um, I, we, we are successful. We have very, very high retention, and we have for decades. Uh, and I think it's just you know the work we do for an investor is probably the most interesting work any investor anywhere can find. So it's it's super interesting. We have a wonderful group of people to work with. Everyone is truly collaborative uh, here at Brookfield. So we attract a certain kind of person, like Doug, um, uh, who wants to work in that kind of environment. And finally, because we're growing, and you know, for, you were here for um, the present presentation yesterday, the brand presentation. Because we're growing in every vertical in so many ways, we can we can offer enormous growth opportunities for our uh, for our younger people and put them in leadership roles at a really young uh, stage in their career. So we feel confident about that. Um, are there any questions in the audience here? Yeah, good morning. This is uh, James Gloin from National Bank. Uh, question is, is on a theme around the uh, technology and innovation investments. We heard uh, the Brookfield Asset Management uh, presentation yesterday talk about significant investments there as well. How does Brookfield as a complex determine what investments go to BBU versus BAM in their technology uh, uh, strategies as well? And maybe some of the criteria that you look at. Yeah, so, so when we're buying companies that are more mature they're generating cash and their largest size, that fits BBU. That's exactly what we want because we can take it, we can do a lot with it to create value. We do all the things that we talked about today, Doug talked about today. Uh, venture, I'll say more venture stage financing has been done at the BAM level and it's possible over time we start doing that in BBU as BBU gets larger. Um, it's quite possible we do that over time. But right now, that's the approach we've been taking. Any other questions? Suzanne, how are we doing? OK, says I have a minute. Um, what type of color can you share on the decision to pull the Clarios offering? So for those of you don't, that don't know, uh, we attempted to uh, do an initial public offering of our advanced um, energy storage business. And we pulled the offering in the summer. And look, what we concluded is uh, fundamentally, we just made a mistake. When, when you cut through it all, we made a mistake. We went at a very busy time uh, in the market. Uh, there were six offerings pulled that week. Um, we, were, we went in the summer. You know, shame on, on me and us for doing that. It's not typically a great time to try and raise capital. Uh, and, and the offering was too large. We should have, you know, we were trying to do what would have been probably the largest IPO of an industrial company in history. Um, so, look, when we think about it and come back to the market at some point, we will change some of those parameters and are, we'll be confident it'll get done. I will tell you, we have had several SPACs frothing at the mouth, wanting to uh, IP de-SPAC into Clarios because it's such an incredible uh, business. The other alternative we, we have and we kick around is should we just keep it private? Um, Jasper talked about the deleveraging. I mean, our earnings are growing, so our debt to EBITDA is dropping. Y you know, we, we could add a billion and a half dollars to this company if we wanted to, and I'm not saying we're going to do it and you know, pay 3% interest rate. So, I mean, there, there are lots of opportunities here for this uh, business. 
So with that, I'm getting the, the hook. Thank you very much.